depending on where you are in the world. Quick audio check. Everybody should be able to hear us now. And welcome to the uh, July webinar. Um, I'm Joel Obstfeld, one of the team members uh, behind Viral. And uh, we've got a uh, special guest on uh, today. We've got, I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda in a moment. Um, so Q&A, the panel is up now and we've got members of the team standing by to answer the questions. Can't promise that we're going to get through all of the questions uh, in the time that we have available, but we'll do our best. And if you've joined us previously, you'll know that we try to go through the questions as best we can on the, on the sessions. Any of those that we can't do, we try to answer those questions and post uh, the answers afterwards along with a recording of this webinar. So you'll be able to find that on the community website. Um, so do please keep the questions coming throughout uh, and we'll do our best to try and answer those. Okay, so today on the agenda, we have a special guest. Uh, Dion, who's going to be talking in a few minutes. You, some of you may have seen some of the work that he's done uh, on the community website under the uh, the acronym of virtual pa uh, sorry acronym the pseudonym of virtual packets. So uh, Dion's done a lot of work with the third party virtual machine integration, and he's going to be uh, showing us some of the work that he's done and some of the uh, the methods that he uses for for tackling third party virtual machine integration. We have a new version of Viral in the works that's going to be coming out very soon, and we're going to be showing you some of the new capabilities and functionality that you can be looking forward to in the next couple of weeks. And then we're also showing you a couple of features. So they're not going to be in the next Viral release, just to be clear, not in the next Viral release, but pieces of work that we have in progress right now, and uh, we want to give you um, a view of some of those. And then rounding off with a little bit of Q&A, so again, you know, keep those questions coming throughout. All right, so um, I'd like to introduce everybody to, to Dion. He's going to do a little introduction uh, himself. And um, some of you may have seen a, a very popular post on third-party virtual machine integration uh, that's up on the community website. There are something like uh, 12 or 13 different virtual machines that are, that are up there today. And uh, Dion's got, uh, uh, or Dion's contributed extensively to to that. So we are invited Dion to come along uh, and talk about some of the work that he's done in that regard. So um, Dion, I'm going to hand the ball over to you and um, take it away, sir. Thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some um, third-party uh, virtual machine integration today, um, how I approach the third-party integration, uh, what, what, what sort of things you need to look for um, when, when trying to add the third-party uh, virtual machines into, into Viral um, going forward, really. So like Joel said earlier, we have approximately about 12 or 13 uh, virtual machines, um, third-party virtual machines currently integrated into Viral. Quite an extensive list. It's, it's growing uh, considerably every every week or so, really. Um, I've integrated the Fortinet uh, firewall. We've got a short um, video demonstration on that, how you add that coming up shortly. And the Palo Alto Networks uh, firewall as well. Um, again, I've got some tips um, to show you how to get the, the most out of the third-party virtual machines. Uh, down at the bottom here, we've got the KVM Vert IO drivers for Windows. So anybody who wants to add Windows integration into, into Viral, you're going to need to download these um, Vert IO drivers. These are special drivers that uh, work with the KVM environment, which obviously Viral runs underneath the operating system. So you need these special drivers to be able to uh, get Windows uh, working within the in Viral. And there's a, a nice demonstration uh, already up on the Viral uh, website that you can follow through. It shows you how to, how to build a Windows third-party virtual machine. So moving on, uh, there's a, some of the third-party virtual machines um, don't come in the QM2 format, which is required to integrate and import into, into Viral. 
So there's a couple of commands here that you can run on the viral host that allow you to convert the uh, different formats. So here we've got the raw format, which I believe the, the Netscaler um, virtual machine integration I did, they, they supplied that in the, in the raw format. So I had to use this command here at the top to convert that from raw into the QCAL format and then import that in to the viral host. Um, you're going underneath that, you've got the VM conversion options, the virtual box, and uh, Hyper-V. So all, all of these commands are actually run within the viral host itself. So you, what, what you would need to do is upload the image um, to the viral host and then run these commands from the console, and then that would convert it, and then you can import it in using the Workspace Manager. So the Ralph, uh, one of the developers, has already posted the uh, viral to to topology extensions reference. So this is a good reference to go and have a look at. It's got over, I think it's got about about nine or ten extensions that you can um, put onto the nodes within Viral and um, get some extra benefits. Uh, so one of the, one of these benefits is the static IP. Once this is assigned to any node, uh, this this will allow it to have a static IP address. So every every time you start the node up, it will come back with this IP address rather than getting a, a DHCP assigned address, which is um, it's very useful because uh, it's uh, on on some of the third-party virtual machines, um, the the management is actually built into the IP address. So if the, obviously if the IP address changes then you won't be able to access the device when it boots back up and you have to go in and change it with, with, with a static command. You can assign that and that virtual machine will always boot up with that static IP address. And to do that, uh, you log into the user workspace manager and you have to change the guest. Where you, you can either create a new account with admin privileges or you can create the easiest ways to update the guest account that's, that's built in. And just modify that and give yourself admin permissions. So you just move over and um, modify the permissions. And a little drop down a box will appear and you just change the member access to admin. And then click save. And then that should all be taken care of before. But you can't actually use the static command without this. So this is a requirement for, for this to work. You have to give yourself the admin privileges for the static command to work. And then under the node properties within the, uh, the actual third party or, or even Cisco um, iOS device, XR, whatever it may be, you can assign a static IP address. Here we're just using 172.16.1.140. So every time the device boots up, it's going to get this IP address. The config underneath it, this is where you inject the special c configuration parameters. The, these here for the VM. Um, in it config. This is specific to the Palo Alto device, so this isn't anything to do with uh, Viral itself. So you have to read the documentation. I got this from the documentation. These parameters are fed in from the actual Palo Alto documentation. So you, it takes this XML file and then presents this XML file as the CD-ROM just below it, and then basically what it does is reads in this XML file when it boots up with all these parameters. So it takes in the host name, uh, the IP address, netmask, people gateway, etc. Unfortunately, it's just limited to these parameters on the Palo Alto. So unfortunately, you can't inject the whole of the config, which is a bit limiting, really. But that's that's uh, down to the uh, image itself, unfortunately. Um, Another, another tip that we can do is the snapshots. Again, within the user workspace manager, you've got the running session. So you click on the running session, and it will take you into it's going to take you into some session options. There we go. 
and under here you can create a, I'm not too sure if you can see that on the screen there, but you can take a snapshot of the actual running node. So when the actual device is booted up, you've got all the configuration on there, your config, whatever it may be. You can do these on uh, the same Cisco uh, devices as well. A any any device, third party VM, you can take a snapshot of, and then you can use that snapshot later on. I'll show you how to do that just shortly. You can use that as a startup parameter for the snapshot. So it keeps, it basically it's like a persistent storage because you can't obviously write the config to, to these devices but as, as standard. Wait for the next slide. There we go. Right. So once, once you take the snapshot, it will appear in the virtual machine images. So this is just down the bottom here on option number one. And then you go, you go back to your node type and then select the new virtual image, the snapshot image um, down here at the bottom where it says virtual machine image. So you'd select the new option one virtual image. And once that's selected, you, once, you, once you restart the node, it will keep all the parameters that you've just set. So it will load back up with the config, all the IP addressing, um, the firewall rules, everything that, that you previously took the snapshot, snapshot of. And that's it for the snapshots. So I think we've got a small video as well, which I think uh, one of the presenters is going to demonstrate now for, you, for the uh, firewall. Yep, thanks, Dion. We're going to play the video that you recorded for for the session now. Oh. Welcome to this file demonstration where we'll be looking at adding a custom third party virtual machine to file today. So let's get started. Let's click on the user workspace management. Then we go down to subtypes on the left hand menu here. And today we'll be adding the FortiGate file uh, into Viral. And we'll be basing the FortiGate file on the generic subtype. The the subtypes uh, define how the virtual machine is going to start up at uh, boot up time. So here we can customize the settings. Yeah. We'll click specialize. I'm just going to give this a name of FortiGate. I'm going to give the description of the plugin FortiGate Firewall. The main name of the management interface we call that port one. This can be any any name you like really, um, but it's best to keep it in line with the virtual machine that you're importing. I say it doesn't have to tie up with the naming convention of the virtual machine, but it's best to you, you could call it anything you like. Uh, in, in this um, Fortigate demonstration, they use the naming convention of port. So. And we're going to start the first data interface off at number two. And we have nine interfaces in total. And the, we're not going to be using any line cards in this example. And the number of serial interfaces, we're going to be using one. This uh, is what defines or allows us access to the console after the device starts, which is uh, quite important if we need to customize the virtual machine after it starts up. So the network protocol, this is here we have the option of SSH or Telnet, and this is what the management port will use uh, for access. Uh, make VNC available as well. So we've got option here to use VNC to get access to the device after it loads up. So we've got the option of serial console access, SSH access in via the out of bound management or the VNC access, which is uh, another type of serial access by the console. And 
here, we're going to give it a name Firewall for the icon. And we want to select this show subtype on the GUI palette. This um, will basically automatically add the subtype to the VM Maestro palette after it adds up. So we need to tick this uh, to make that happen. The configuration disk type, we've got several options in here. We've got CD-ROM, disk, cloud in it, ISO, and VFAT. These options uh, here allow us to inject a, configura a configuration file at startup. So if the, if the virtual machine supports it, you can preload some of the configuration at startup. So in this case, it would be presenting a CD-ROM and are presenting this file to here. So if we added a, uh, for instance, test.csg, it would present this file uh, to the CD-ROM at startup. But in our case, it doesn't allow you to do this for this virtual machine. For the virtual interface model, we've got a couple of options here. E1000, which is based on the Intel driver, Vert.io, and the Realtek uh, driver. Again, you need to check uh, the, which type your virtual machine will select to uh, will use here. So in our case, uh, it's going to use Vert.io. And the same with the uh, the disk model here. So IDE, Vert.io, or SCSI. Again, Vert.io is optimized for virtual machines. So if it, if it supports it, use the Vert.io uh, method. If it doesn't, it's going to support E1000 or the Realtek uh, driver for the network, and again for the IDE or SCSI for the for the disk space options. If you get these wrong, basically your virtual machine is not going to load up, or if it does load up, you're not going to have access to the network interface cards if you've selected the wrong type. So you just need to double check this. Um, we're going to allocate one gig of RAM per node per firewall. And here we've got the option of up to 16 CPUs. So in this case, we're going to select one. We're not going to fill any of these other options in. These are filled in by default for us, and we're not going to add any uh, special image image properties at this stage. So we click Create. This was uh, created successfully, so that's great. And now what we need to do is import the actual image into our custom subtype, using our custom subtype. So from here, we click Add. And we need to click, uh, click uh, select our new subtype from the menu here, FortiGate. And I'm just going to use, in this case, it's version 5. Give it a release number. And we've got a couple of options here for the source file. So you can either have a file on the on the file uh, viral server itself. Uh, you can select a URL or a local image on your local machine. So in this case, we're just going to select the file I've already uploaded. So in our case, we've put it in my home folder of viral, and it's in the images folder, and it's called Fort I. Uh, Fort IS QCAL. Uh, click Create. There we are. And that's also created successfully, which is fantastic. Here we can see its um, size on the drive at the moment is 30 meg, and it's a maximum of 2 gig drive. It picks these uh, values up from the actual image itself when it's imported in. So you don't need to define these. And now, all we need to do now is go into VM Maestro and import the subtype. So here, create a new uh, new topology. So go down here, create a new topology. Give it a name. Forticate in this example. And from here now. We just need to load up our new subtype. 
in the in the palette here because at the moment it's not showing up in the palette options so to get that and the new subtype loaded in we need to go to preferences and then on the node subtypes we need to fetch from server this will refresh and collect all the subtypes off of the viral backend server so we'll click those and we should see the 40 gate um, subtype and image loading there we go and we can see it's all all the options that we chose which is fantastic click OK now it should be in the menu here there it is so we can now just drop this onto the canvas and then from here we just need to select the image type as well so again Fortigate and release version 5 and once we've done that we can uh, fire up the topology so click OK I'm just going to switch to the uh, simulation uh, simulation view here. Okay. Click yes. Just automatically move into the simulation view. And here, just building our image. So uh, once the device is up and running, uh, we should see it active we should be able to click on the external, sorry, we should be able to hear, and we need to make a note of the, this IP address here, the management interface, if we want to SSH into this. But uh, if you don't want to SSH into it, um, we, from the console here, so if we don't want to right click on it and access it this way, this this you can just ignore this and just configure uh, another IP address, but if you want to right click on this, you have to select this option here. So we're just going to turn it into the console and we're going to log in. The default password is admin and there's no password. And now get access to the system we need to configure a couple of basic options to uh, get us access so we need to configure the system interface we need to then configure the port port number one which we configured earlier and then we're going to set the IP address to the same as what we used on the management interface up here under the SSH option. Um, we're going to allow HTTP access to this interface. You can also allow SSH as, as, as well here. And just get in that. close this down and we can go back to here now and we should be able to SSH into the uh, device now for the management port Thank you very much for doing that, Dion. 
Um, Dion, just in general, when people are approaching trying to add those third-party virtual machines in, are there particular things that people need to be paying attention to? An example, you highlighted the issue around network device drivers, the hard disk type, and that you can end up in a situation where everything looks to be okay, but you can't access the system, or it doesn't boot, or the network interface is, is missing. How do you generally a, a address that? Any tricks, any tips on that? Most, most of the time, um, it does involve reading the manual if you want to get it right first time, but failing that, trial and error, you know, there's, there's not that many options there, will actually get the device to boot up. But it's, it's, it's best to read the manual on the, which parameters are, are required. If it's a KVM image, they're, they're pretty straightforward, and they will pretty much boot up straight away the KVM in, images. But if, it's, if, if, you've can, if you've taken the image from VMware, it might need a little bit more work, the same with VirtualBox and uh, the raw images, et cetera. But the KVM images will pretty much load in straight away, and they will, and they will tell you which options to use generally. And not all, not all the manufacturers do, unfortunately. But uh. so, um, I mean, I've seen and, and, and have encountered situations where you've got virtual machine images that have been built for VMware for, for ESXi. Can I take ESXi and just bring that straight across? It, would, would that generally work or, or, or not? In some cases, yes. In, in other cases, no. It depends if it's got any special drivers loaded on just for VMware. And then in some cases, you may have to boot it up within that environment and remove those before they will work, potentially. Does that void the manufacturer's warranty, in quotes? You're, you're, probably, not gonna, you're, you're <laughs> probably not going to get any support, but you, you might have a, you know, if, if they only give you an image on VMware and you want to run it on KVM, you, you haven't really got a lot of choice. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, are there particular, uh, I mean, uh, ones where you've really run into brick walls and certainly would say to the community, hey, could really do with some help trying to uh, tackle Virtual Machine X or Y? Um, not really with the basic startup, but uh, I think we could do with some more um, assistance around how we how we inject some of the custom code in and which options to use there around the CD-ROM and bits and pieces like that, because that's not, that's not so straightforward. And that's, that's not very well documented at all from any of the vendors, if, if at all, to be honest. Interesting, that's, interesting. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly I've, I've seen instances where there are some machines that just don't support configuration injection at all. No, again, this is based on their environment that, that they're originally going into. So for, for things like the Palo Alto or the Fortigate, for instance, if if they um, su support that option, it's fantastic. Uh, but it's obviously there to deploy um, images from within uh, the virtual environments quickly. So obviously you can deploy these within Hyper-V and uh, VMware and, and bits and pieces very quickly with this code injection. But yeah, but but you lose that that kind of automated configuration capability. Yeah. Yeah. So, so some of them will support the automated capabilities. Some of the better vendors, the smaller vendors, probably not not going to even have that option. To let you do it. Yeah. Are there any uh, particular virtual machines that you would say you really should take a look at X or Y as an example of you know a simple one for people to get started with? So if people want to cut their teeth on it, so to speak. I mean, obviously, you've given us the FortiGate example here. Just wondering if there are any others that you say, yeah, that's a really nice one just to, to yeah, you know, play with. One of the HP ones there as well, the HP HP VSR, pretty straightforward. Um, I was looking yeah, at okay. uh, another one from Array Networks as well. That's another one of the application controllers, which isn't on this list. Um, the other day, they, they also do a KVM image that you should be able to import straight in. Okay, great. Okay, um, Dion, thank you very much for taking the time for doing this demonstration for us. Um, we will get uh, Dion's video up and uh, you know, posted for people to take a look at. Obviously, all the instructions are there in that detailed uh, video walkthrough. And I just uh, also point to that uh, posting that Dion, um, uh, Dion mentioned right back at the beginning, which has got that list of uh, machines. If you've got a virtual machine that you'd like to get added onto that list, something that you've you know you've uh, figured out how to get integrated, you know let let's, let us have the information if you don't mind, and uh, we'll add it onto the list and you know help other people. It would be uh, absolutely fantastic. We can get some more uh, machines added to the list. 
Dion, thank you very much once again. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a new viral release in the works. It's uh, getting closed up uh, right now. It's into the final stages of testing. And we want to give you uh, some information as to what's coming, what you can expect to see. Um, so we have a series of new virtual machine images that are going to be included. So you can see the complete list there. Pieces uh, that are in here. So the NXOS, this one, the 720D1D, I don't know what, what it D1D, but the D1D is the 720 uh, FS image that's shipping with the Nexus 7000 hardware system. So we had a previous 720 image, which was a, a pre release. We now have got the, uh, the, the, the full image. Very, very happy to announce that we've got a new version of iOS V, the 1553M, which includes, um, as, as many of you have been uh, highlighting and some people have been uh, question, uh, asking questions on the uh, Q&A panel today, um, a reduced uh, CPU load. Um, so the team have been looking at what's been going on, why we're seeing such high CPU load, and been able to do some modifications to the code which are bringing the CPU loads down fairly significantly. We're seeing something like a 10 to 15% CPU load drop. Um, so that's bringing that, lo that uh, load down. The memory footprint is still the same, but the CPU load that you see, the utilization levels are coming down. Um, and that fix has gone both into iOS V and also into iOS VL2. And as you can see mentioned on the screen, so we've got some new capabilities in the layer two switch image. So uh, ACL support, also the switch port protected mode. Um, there is more capability that's coming uh, in, in new releases that we'll have in the next few months. So what's new? What's coming? Um, for those of you who are at Cisco Live uh, back in June, you will have seen some of these things. Um, this isn't a complete list by any stretch of the imagination, but some of the ones we're going to show you in a moment. Um, so the Git repo uh, support uh, directing a new interface that we have within the user workspace management. So we'll show you all of that coming through. Uh, the live visualization has had a fairly significant update. So we're going to show you some of that uh, capability in a moment. Another piece, uh, people have been asking about trying to management ports because people things like CDP packets being there, in some cases even uh, going out through management ports. So we've put a function into kit to separate out the management you're using VRF light, that separation. For the GNS3 out there, we've got GNS3 import export capability, VM Maestro for the new um, new uh, formats, so it's the JSON file format. So that's the most recent, I believe, new uh, version of, of GS3. Um, also, uh, we're going to show you this in a moment, Linux container support. So this is Linux LXCs. Um, so this is, uh, there's more work to come in this regard. Um, with uh, things like Docker support that are coming in, but uh, we're going to show you some of those capabilities. Okay, so let's take a look at some of this now. So I'm going to try and share. There we go. Okay, so I mean, just oops, share up another application here. So one moment. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can see um, these pieces. So first up, um, we're going to take a look at uh, Git repo integration. So in the user workspace management interface, we've got a, a, a different layout. Um, when you come in as a user, um, and we're going to see that here. So we've reorganized uh, various parts of the menu. You're going to see this new uh, setting here. It's called the L LXC settings. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later, but we'll, we'll come back and take a look in here. But if you come in under user, we now have a whole series of new functions that you've got in here. 
One of the things that you've got is this option called repositories. So we can reach into, uh, let me just delete that one. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we can reach out to the network and pull in sets of topology files. So we just go in, and in this case, I'm going to pull down from uh, the viral open repository, which is up on GitHub. So this is an open repository, no password required. And all we need to do is then press clone. So this is now reaching out to the network, and that's it. It's now sucked down um, a series of topology files, which I can now take a look at. So with my topologies, I can now see the series of elements that we've got in here. So if we take a look in webinars, we can see, uh, oops, what happened there? Um, there we go. So here are the webinars from the previous webinars that we've done. So I can pick up one of these, for example, and I can see the content of the viral file here. If I put it in raw format, it's gonna remove all this formatting for me. And I also can do a preview. So it's gonna take the file, and there we go. We can take a quick look at it and say, okay, is this the topology that I want to launch? And if so, I can then press this quick launch function and away we go. It will then bring all of that stuff up. Okay, so that's the, the, the new Git repo functionality. As I said, this could be a repo that's out on the internet. It could be something that's sitting within you know, a company network somewhere or something, you know, maybe something you've set up locally on a, on a server sitting at home. Right. We mentioned the LXC's uh, function earlier. What we've got is Linux container support now in place. So here we're going to be running Linux containers directly on the host. So this gives you an ability to be running lightweight, by comparison to a full virtual machine, lightweight um, container, which will give you what looks like a virtual machine, in this case, running uh, Ubuntu. Um, you can, and we'll be providing instructions, you can build your own. So you could have a container which has, for example, an Apache web server or a VLC video server or running iPerf. There will be a, a series of things that you, that you may wish to create and have these as application servers that are running on your workspace. So here in VM Maestro, I've brought up a simulation um, which has got a series of LXCs. So this is actually running um, on a relatively lightweight server. The key thing about these LXCs is once I've spun up one, to then add more of these is relatively simple. It doesn't take a huge amount of memory. It doesn't take a huge amount of CPU. And you can have these devices sitting there. Um, so if you want to simulate, for example, a data center network, um, in this case, you'd have four virtual machines that are running, the two iOS VL2, the, IO, uh, the two iOS V instances, and that would be it. The rest are just LXCs, they're just containers. So if I wanna connect in uh, on one of these devices, um, so here we are, we're already on. Uh, you just move that window over there. Okay, so I'm gonna try and go from the LXC1 over to LXC8, which is over here on the other side. Um, so we can see when we connect in, it just looks and feels exactly like uh, as if I were connecting into a normal Linux machine. And here we can see an IP address, so 10.0.0.14. Here we've got the device on this side, 10.0.0.2. So if I do a trace path, 10.0.0.0. Yep, so that's now sending track up through the switches across on the other side. And take a look at the amount of memory that's actually running at the amount of CPU that's running here. If we look at the KVM real, there we can see those are the IOS V, the IOS VL2 instances that are running there. And we can see, you know, the LXCs hardly even show up. They're very, very light, um, very small. Um, so we actually do, uh, so it's like uh, LXC info, oh, LXC LS. Oh, sorry, pseudo. So here we can see the various containers that are up and running. So if I do um, the pseudo LXC info, uh, oops, dash dash name, and just pick one of these devices. Here we can see, so this is a Linux container, and we can see the amount of memory it's actually using is 10 megs. So very, very small, very lightweight by comparison to a full-blown virtual machine. Okay, let's take a look at something else that's uh, new. So within my interface, 
um, if I come in and go into the admin, sorry, as, as user, I now have this new option to be able to launch a session. So from here, I can go in and pick a viral file. So this could be from my Git repository. This could be sitting locally on my laptop, for example, or this could be sitting out there on the web. So I can pick a file. So let me pick up something. Um, so for example, this one. I can then do the preview. And that's going to then give me the view of the network. There it is. So we're going to be showing this one in a moment. And if I'm happy with this, let's launch. And in the session, as I've said many times before, here's one I did earlier. So I can now take a look at this particular view. And here we're going to get um, this web page, which will now give me a complete status on the simulation that's running right now. So here I get all my nodes, so I can change the view, um, list all my various devices, I see my management IP, I see my console connections. Um, if you're checking this during boot up, uh, at the moment it's a, a manual refresh to just get the updates and see what status there is. And as we go further down, and some of you may have played with this before, we've then still got our traffic capture and our interface functions. So here, if I want to pick up a particular interface and create a traffic capture or change the interface state, I can do that all from this interface. And we also have all the log messages. Uh, and you can do the complete download of all the log messages. You can also filter. So just as an example of filtering, so I can do something like show me all the nodes that have got you know, uh, dash 2 present. So it's now matching all of the nodes that have dash 2. And it will also then filter um, the interfaces, again, that will match up according to that. So I can uh, put a filter in here and, again, filter the various views. I can do my extract configuration, so I can do a selective extract of the configuration, or I could select all nodes, start nodes, stop nodes, um, start and stop the, the entire simulation. We also have updated the live visualization, so we're going to take a look at that now. So we need to pass in the username and password under the, the project where they started. And now that's going to give me this particular view. So not a huge amount of change here. There's some render changes that have happened. Um, but some new functionality. So from here, I can now say, right, I'd like you to set up syslog. Virtual machine, the system's now going to reach in and configure syslog for me. So we'll see a series of operations taking place. We'll run through. So we can see the select log is going. There's actions. And if we watch here, syslog is now coming up on this side. So we can see the records as they're coming up from the virtual machines being passed into that syslog server. Another new function that we have here is I can now do my route table collection. So running the action, and if we watch the collect log, there it goes. I can now click on the log, and here I can see the complete route table from uh, being captured from inside each one of these devices. So similarly, um, we can do things like, let's take a look at uh, the IBGP um, view. And it's going to reach in. There we go. It's collecting, and it's building the view as we go in. OK, so we have a, an interesting There's a problem or some description there. Um, we can take a look at EBGP. Yeah, so it looks like we've got a problem with a particular node that's there. OK, if we flip back to the physical view. There we go. Um, we can now do the trace route. Well, we had this capability before. So we have a, a new uh, interface that we can do here. So I can say something like, if I right mouse against this particular device, I have my ability to shut down. Or say, right, I'm going to do a trace from. And let's send it over here. Say trace to. And that's now going to send the traffic across from one side to the other. And that's now rendered on the diagram. Now I'm going to do something where we're going to bring a couple of uh, links down. So I'm going to actually take um, this particular, uh, uh, let's take this link out. So I can click on the link. And here we can see disable interface, set up packet capture, do the trace from or to. So I'm going to disable the interface. And that should go down in a moment. And again, disable the interface. And hopefully you can see that the status has just changed from green to red. Let me just clear the path. 
so I've shut these particular links down. Now that's going to take a, a moment um, to to have effect because that and to uh, impact our protocol. But if we take a look at this blog, here we can now see that 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 action of bringing the interface down has now resulted in um, messages being sent up to the syslog server. So if we now go back and rerun that uh, trace path, let's see you know, where the route is now going. So that's been sent across. Is it going to show us where it's going? Maybe it hasn't reconverged yet. Nope, looks like it hasn't reconverged yet. Typical. OK, let's see if we can go from another device. Trace from, let's just go here, trace to. It's not playing ball. But honestly, you will be able to rerun it and be able to see once the convergence has taken place. Oh, maybe some more stuff has happened. There we go. OK, so let's just go back. Trace from, trace to. And we should hopefully get that render happening. No, it's not going to play ball. OK. But hopefully you can see some of the capabilities that are present in here. And just to be clear, this does not rely on AutoNetKit to build this topology up. It will actually learn the topologies from IP addressing structures that you are building yourselves. OK. So let me just stop the share. All right. So that's just a flavor of some of the pieces that are coming through um, that are going to be in the next release. We are a matter of a couple of weeks away from having that release out. You will be able to do the normal uh, in-place upgrades. And we're expecting also to have the uh, ISO and OVA images available for you as well. OK, we'd like to show you uh, a couple more pieces. Um, and for this one, I'm going to hand over in a moment to my colleague, Dan. Um, but two pieces that we were showing at Cisco Live. Our first one is an update, a major update to VM Maestro with a new active canvas piece. And then um, there's going to be um, the new web-based uh, topology editor. Um, so as, I said, as it says on the slides, these are still features in progress. Um, not sure exactly when they're going to be available, but uh, we want to share those with you guys to, to give you a sense as to, to what's coming up. OK, so Dan, I'll hand it over to you, sir. All right, thank you, Joel. I'll just share the entire desktop. Okay, um, you should be able to see my instance of VM Maestro. So what I am showing here is a uh, topology. Um, I'm about to launch it. Before I do, I just wanted to pull your attention to one of the nodes here. I currently have this one node set to be excluded from the simulation launch, just to show you the visualization effect of that. So if I go ahead and hit uh, launch, the whole intent of what we are tentatively calling Active Canvas is to be able to allow the user to interact with their topology directly on the main canvas rather than have to deal with the simulations view. So this is the newly launched topology. Uh, don't worry about the aesthetics yet. We're still revising some of that. But uh, as you can see, as it's coming up, you will see state information populate the main canvas. Uh, this running simulation also appears in its own separate tab. What that allows you to do is actually go back to the original topology and relaunch, and relaunch, and relaunch. And all your concurrently running simulations will appear side by side and allow you to flip back and forth between them. So as you can see, they're coming up. Some nodes are still in building state. The simulations view has also gotten a little bit of an aesthetic tweak so that the states are shown visually. Um, and those same states are rendered now on the active canvas. So I'll let it come all the way up. And again, I'll remind you that PE4 was set not to launch. So that's why all the interfaces emanating from it have this little question mark. It simply states that that interface is not available or not applicable right now because it's not launched. I actually have a second topology already running of that same topology. Sorry, did I say that right? A second simulation of that same topology running concurrently. So um, to open the 
again, it's just tentative name for now, Active Canvas on this topology. You can just right click and say Open Active Canvas or simply double click on the simulation entity itself. And this is what I meant. So you have a topology, sorry, a simulation instance here and here, and you can flip back and forth between the two. So it allows you to kind of test bed different uh, configuration changes on the fly. Uh, so the whole intent is that all of the um, user interactions you, uh, you used to only be able to do via the simulations view are now present on the canvas as well. Not just the visualization, but all of the context menu actions, SSH and start and stop and VNC and all that stuff is available on the individual nodes, on the individual connections, on the simulation, the LXC container, the jump host, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so as Joel displayed via the um, web-based editor, you can also do it here. You can see both endpoints here. If I go here and say bring link down, which I think he called uh, disable interface, we can uh, revise that very easily. You can see the link state being represented not only in the connection um, label decoration, uh, but also as a decoration on the on the link itself. So this is important because in the case that you have a topology that has multiple links between any two nodes, uh, actually I already have a simulation running of this one topology. Let me open it up in an active canvas. Um, you can see that one of <laughs> this one line actually is uh, three different internode connections. But if you fan it out by selecting it, you'll see that one of those connections have a link down. So that's why even when it's collapsed onto a single line, any indicators like that percolate up to the top, making it very intuitive for you to interact with it. And lastly, you can also now uh, create, whoops. <laughs> so I'll remind folks that this is a preview, <laughs> and I'll go ahead. Um, I tempted fate this morning, the demo gods, and I actually just launched, uh, uh, made a, a significant change to the layout manager, which seems to have reared its ugly head right now. So the good news is uh, you don't need to relaunch. You go back to your simulations view, and you simply double click on a topology to open up its active canvas. And lo and behold, you have all the state coming up instantly. Um, uh, and the packet capture, yeah. So if I right-click on a given interface and say create a packet capture on this one node, you will see that it's being indicated and we're working on having a separate view that will list all currently running and completed packet captures, allowing you to manage them that way, uh, see the current states and all that stuff, or download directly from there. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, any questions? Otherwise, I'll pass the ball back on to Joel. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Okay, um, we've got running against time now. Um, so we'll uh, try and get this through and try and answer some of the Q&A stuff. Uh, so we've got another little video. Um, again, this is an item that we uh, were showing at Cisco Live. Um, Valerie, do you want to, you got the video there? You can run that? Yep. This is the, the show reel we played at Cisco Live, showing the new features that are coming up. All right. So, so this is a, a an additional function. So you'll recognize part of um, the interface that I demonstrated a little bit earlier. Um, we we're picking up a uh, file, so exactly the same as we had before. Okay. So we can pick up a particular topology. But now there's going to be this additional button. Um, we can do this preview, but you may have noticed that there was also an editor function. Okay, so this is still work in progress, but the intent is to be able to have a web-based editor. So I can either start from scratch or take something like we're doing here and adding to an existing topology and have the capabilities like that that you have within the Eclipse-based editor um, running here on a, a web-based framework. So same kinds of capabilities, not everything um, that you have, the capabilities within VM Maestro. So for example, the direct Git integration that you have with VM Maestro, not sure whether we're going to get that into the web-based interface or not. Um, but this is still a, a little way out, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of where we want to be able to go, what we want to try to be able to do. Um, there are people who, who like the Eclipse-based editor capability, the offline editing capability and functionality. 
Um, there are other people who uh, prefer a, a web-based UI. So we're, we're trying to, to address both of those. Thank you for running that, Valerie. Okay. okay. Um, we have a few more. Uh, ask the rest of the panelists particular questions we can try and address on the call now. Dan, Tom, Alejandro, any questions that you want to flag up? Uh, Joel, we had a question about F5 Big IP, which I know that uh, was on the third party viral VM. Ah, uh, yes. Post, but I don't know if that's still coming or. Yeah, is. so so the one of the community members was looking at the F5 Big IP integration. We know that it has been done. We know of people who have managed to get it done, but in terms of actually getting the documentation of how to do it, uh, we haven't seen that. Unfortunately, the particular community member who who sort of stuck his hand up and said, yes, 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 I'll do it, um, has not had a chance to do it. I don't know if there's any volunteers, anybody out there who's already got it done. Uh, if so, it would be fantastic if we can work with you to, to understand how you got that set up. Um, we know at least it, well, <laughs> we know it has been done. We know that, but it's just a case of getting the documentation together about what are the various steps, et cetera, to get that in place. But any volunteers, um, please let us know. We're very, very happy to work with you on that. Any other questions? Um, lots of questions about the VMs, but I think we covered a lot of those. I, I, like I said, the NXOSV, there is some particular interest there, but um, I think that one is just a incremental bug fix update at this point. That's um, correct. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, uh, there there look to be positive movements in that direction of getting more capabilities into the NXOS. But this release that's coming is a, literally it's a small increment seven two zero one twenty eight dev image that we had before. Um, so I don't believe that there are any new capability. I think there are some bug fixes in the NX API. Uh, if anybody's using that, then uh, yeah, uh, you'll be able to pick that up. And, and since it's always a popular issue, did you want to uh, say anything about the um, node limit questions? Oh, the node limit questions, the node limit questions. <laughs> okay, so we are reviewing it. We have some plans in place um, to to raise that. I'm going to be deliberately vague, I'm afraid, guys. Um, it is something that we are reviewing. We have some plans in place to be able to raise that limit. It's not technical at all. It really isn't. Uh, obviously, if you've got a relatively small powered uh, system that you're running this on, um, then yeah, you're going to need to look at investing in some larger uh, amounts of hardware to be able to, ru learn to run larger node limits. But uh, yeah, I'm afraid it's going to be a case of stay tuned um, we we hope you will be uh, pleasantly surprised, but uh, you're going to need to be a little bit patient, I'm afraid. All right, we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank Dion again for taking the time to put that session together for us, the video. As I said, we will be posting that video for people to look at and for uh, you know, taking the time to come on a call and, and uh, share his experience with us. Hopefully, it shows people that it's not as scary. You know, you can play with these things. It's not going to burn you. Um, the links are there on the screen right now. So please do post questions, or if you've got information to share, examples. Uh, similarly, with the, the GitHub repo topologies, uh, one of the guys was asking, you know, could we have some more examples of topologies with you know, particular features and functionality, please let us know. Um, we'll see whether we can try and get some stuff crafted. Um, and we hope that uh, you find some useful pieces of information both in there and also up on the YouTube channel. So we're, we're trying to keep putting more, more and more videos up there to, to help you through. But with that, I'm going to just thank you all for attending. Uh, as I said, you know, new version of Viral in the pipe should be with us in a couple of weeks at, at the most, uh, hope sooner than that. Uh, and we hope that at least with uh, the demonstration you've seen today, there are some features and functionality in there that um, you will enjoy uh, getting your hands on and using. 
And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Have an enjoyable rest of the day. And we're going to close up. Thank you.